CubeSats made their reputation for success on the strength of fitting big science into a small space. Forecasting weather, communicating using experimental methods, and trying out new power systems are just a few of the contributions CubeSats are making to space science. Experimental CubeSats are proving their value to researchers by riding piggyback into space. NASA's InSight mission to Mars will carry CubeSats as communications escorts when it lifts off early in 2016. Now, CubeSats will get their own lift into space, complete with orbits tailored to their research and specifications up to NASA standards. Starting as soon as 2017, three companies will begin launching clusters of CubeSats into orbit. With new launch capabilities for small spacecraft, the science return of research off the Earth for the Earth is expected to only get bigger. Hello everyone, this is our briefing to introduce the winners of NASA's Venture Class Launch Services contract competition. VCLS is the start of having a privately developed, dedicated launch capability for NASA-sponsored CubeSats and the growing small satellite market. We'll begin by hearing from representatives from NASA's Launch Services Program at Kennedy and from the Earth Science Division at NASA Headquarters, and then from representatives from the three companies awarded the Launch Services contract, Firefly Space Systems, Rocket Lab USA, and Virgin Galactic. And we'll begin first with Garrett Scrobot, the Alana Mission Lead for the Launch Services Program and Mission Manager from the Kennedy Space Center. Garrett? Thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's announcement of the uh, Adventure Class uh, Launch Service. Uh, this is very exciting for me, and I can speak for the whole CubeSat community today as the initial development of the first CubeSat was back in the late 90s and it was at uh, Stanford University. Today, uh, until today, CubeSats have basically um, depended on other launch vehicles to obtain their rides into space as piggybacks, hitchhikers. Basically, we've been called uh, coach class to space. And now that uh, we have uh, one U's and six U frames, uh, just wanted to give a quick demonstration here. When we talk about CubeSats and what it really is, this is an actual uh, 1U frame. Uh, this could do, this was in the very beginning. And the very genesis of this was a, ba a beanie baby box. If people can remember back in the day when the baby beanies came to market, they were in little glass boxes. Uh, Mr. Le Bob Twiggs at Stanford University said, he took this to his classroom. He says, who in this class can make this a satellite to do useful science on space? And today we see where the, the revolution has gone to. And from there, it's grown to a 2U. And now we don't have a 3U with us, but if you take that and stack it on top, we have a 3U system. Uh, previously in the video, we heard that InSight will be carrying two 6U spacecraft. And this right here is the frame that these spacecraft will be going to Mars and doing a Martian flyby as uh, InSight descends into the Martian atmosphere to collect data real time and transmit that back to Earth for the first time. So we're very excited about that uh, launch in uh, March uh, 4th of 2016. So by flying piggyback or as secondary, it basically meant that we had to go where the primary went. Uh, we were not able to select our orbits. We had to build our science around those particular orbits or sacrifice some of the science. However, today, now with the new Venture Class launch systems, this is no longer the case. Uh, the CubeSats will now be the primary payloads on these vehicles. We can basically see now we are riding first class. So uh, with these opportunities, they will be able to go to their desired orbits to do their science, their technologies as they need to, to better enhance uh, future missions. So within the Launch Services Program, we manage uh, the Alana Educational Launch of Nanosatellite Missions. And to date, we have launched uh, 10 missions. Uh, last Thursday was our, our 10th flight, of which 41 CubeSats have flown. So of these 41 CubeSat missions, 20 different universities across America have been represented uh, flying their CubeSats. We 
select our CubeSats through the agency's CubeSat launch initiative. Uh, this is the approach by which we uh, put a call out every year, and right now we're in the middle of the call to accept proposals from educational institutions, nonprofits, or even um, NASA centers that will send in proposals. We evaluate the proposals, we put them on a priority list, we submit them, they hand them over to us, and we start manifesting as we go down the pipe. With that, over the next 13 months, we still have five more Lana missions to fly with 14 CubeSats. And now, over the next three years, with the uh, big help from the Venture Class launch system, we will be able to fly our 50 unmanifested CubeSats on our CSI priority list. So one announcement that I can make today, George, is that we can now name our missions a lot of 19, 20, and 21. And each one of these missions will carry anywhere to 45 to 90 one-U equivalents on these missions. So back to you, George. Thank you, Garrett. And now to Eric Iansen, the Associate Director for Flight Programs for the Earth Sciences Division in the NASA Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters. Eric? Thank you, George. It's very exciting to be here today for the announcement of the awardees for the Venture Class Launch Services. Most of the panelists here are from the launch vehicle side. I'm here to represent one of the organizations that hopes to utilize this new capability. NASA's Earth Science Division pushes the envelope for remote sensing instruments and missions. Venture Class investigations are designed to develop and innovate um, small science-driven payloads. Through the Venture Class program, NASA's Earth Science Division solicits instruments where NASA finds the spacecraft and the ride, as well as complete missions. A low-cost launch vehicle capability to support small, low-cost, innovative payloads is a key step forward for Earth Venture projects. Developing low-cost launch vehicles that provide access to space for these payloads will result in a sweet balance between mission capability and investment. Affordable launch vehicles will allow NASA to complete yet uh, to, to fly complete yet low-cost missions that remain focused on science data. The key from an Earth science perspective is getting science payloads into space when and where they are needed. That is, we don't have to compromise science objectives to conform to the mission needs of a larger primary payload. The Earth Science Division's support for these emerging launch vehicles is clearly demonstrated by our participation in this exciting activity that we're discussing today. I congratulate the awardees and look forward to these launches as a key first step for the future. Low-cost launch vehicles like these will allow us to add CubeSats today and even larger small satellites tomorrow to our science toolbox. Thank you. Back to you, George. Thank you, Eric. And now to Mark Weiss, the Flight Projects Office Chief for the NASA Launch Services Program here at Kennedy Space Center. Mark. Thank you, George. So again, first off, a, a big congratulations to the awardees. This has been a, a, a big push that we've been going towards, and to get here today, it's a, a huge step for the commercialization of space, even though we're talking about three smaller rockets. So Launch Services Program, which we represent here at Kennedy, we are Earth's bridge to space. So we provide the science community that Eric's here representing from exploration to earth science to our galaxy, that way to get up to space. So we've been here for the last 15 plus years at Kennedy, leveraging project management, integration, engineering, and analysis skills to try to make that hard rocket science business easy. Whether it's a, a New Horizons mission that we just saw going to Pluto or a Mars rover exploring to the amazing earth science stuff that helps us understand our planet today. So we serve the science community as that launch broker. So the goal of helping enable a healthy US commercial launch industry. And we're always seeking ways to lower that cost to try to help more science get to orbit. So the Venture Class Launch Service was born out of a strategic initiative led by a launch services program rooted in that drive to seek a new way to get to space with a lower price tag compared to that 100 million plus that we see traditionally today for the larger missions. Today, the world's at a unique pivot point with the launch market. So we have a chance to, to enable this new commercialization of space growth that CubeSats have opened up. So there's both new and veteran companies that are pressing ahead with big plans for, for using space as a platform to improve our everyday lives. The Kennedy Space Center here has been pushing to improve and become a multi-user spaceport for all kinds of launches going forward. And we're at a point in technology where innovations, manufacturing, and the growing need for data in our hands real time has kind of opened the door for where we're at with CubeSats. 
So space is no longer just for high value science or the intelligence community. It is a place for a payload that you can create that can get up to space. So our strategic step here with VCLS is to enable that future class of rockets for CubeSats and the SmallSat community as it grows. And we're here today from that amazing investment in the Earth Science Division and helping us try to bring this capability to market. The healthy competition that we're able to spur forward with these three awards will help us all stay on the leading edge of making sure this industry thrives. These three vehicles that we're going to provide to you today and show you, they're all commercially developed. So traditionally, when the government brings a new capability forward, it's something that the government puts money out to try to develop. Here, because of that emerging commercial capability, the emerging market, there's private investment backing the non-reoccurring development costs of these rockets. Traditionally, that represents 10 to 20 times an initial upfront cost of what you see for what we pay for a launch service. The government doesn't have to foot that bill today. So we are able to, to bring forward a new capability with the success of these launches. So we've bought three demonstration flights. These three companies will, before April of 2018, will demonstrate their launch. It'll give the launch service program insight and help open the door for the science community to bring new smaller payloads forward. We're excited for the competition. I can only begin to imagine the opportunities that these companies will open up for you, your children, and the world. George, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And now to the representatives from the awarded launch service providers. We'll begin first with Maureen Gannon, the Vice President for Business Development for Firefly Space Systems. Maureen? Great. Thank you, George. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I jump in and talk specifically about Firefly Space Systems, I'd like to take a moment to thank NASA for making this possible, this event, and for uh, the Venture Class Launch Services in general. So thank you to the VCLS team. Uh, on behalf of myself, I am honored to be here today to accept the award of a Venture Class Launch Services contract on behalf of Firefly Space Systems. We see at Firefly Space Systems VCLS as a vital step in the much larger, uh, much larger mission of growing not only Firefly Space Systems, but the small launch uh, industry as a whole. So let me talk a little bit now specifically around Firefly. So Firefly was started in just January of 2014. And since day one, our mission has been to dramatically reduce the cost of commercial launch for small satellites and science missions in the sub one metric ton payload category. And since I've had the honor of being also part of Firefly since day one, I've been able to watch it grow from a company of four people into the enterprise that it has become today. And I have a video here with me. We can roll to take a look at that. January 2014 and the birth of Firefly Space Systems. Our mission, to change the game for access to low Earth orbit. In just 20 months, Firefly has completed key design reviews for our Alpha launch vehicle and built many of the key components, such as avionics and composite tanks. We have designed and manufactured engines and built our 20,000 square foot R&D facility. We have completed our first test stand on our 200 acre test site and hot fired our engine. Firefly will launch NASA spacecraft to low Earth orbit in March of 2018. Getting things done. Firefly. Great. Uh, what I'd like to add to that is behind everything that you saw there, every milestone, every component is a human being, a part of our team, which is the most valuable asset of Firefly Space Systems. And without them, uh, we wouldn't be here today. For the last 20 months, they have worked tirelessly on developing our first vehicle, the Alpha, which is a two-stage, all-composite rocket capable of delivering up to 400 kilos to LEO. And we think it'll be unlike anything that's come before it. We're very excited about it. Uh, 
So that's where we are at now and looking forward into the future. In 2017, we will start our series of test uh, suborbital flights from right here at Kennedy Space Center under an agreement we have recently inked with Space Florida. We're very, very uh, excited about that as well. Um, so at that time, we'll be proud to call ourselves Floridians and signal to the world that the most exciting and innovative technologies in space access are still happening right here on the Space Coast. Then in 2018, our company will begin launching orbital missions, eventually ramping up to 50 missions per year. Uh, so that means we will be offering weekly scheduled access to LEO and allowing customers such as NASA to pick and choose the flights that work best for them, that fit their mission and their schedules so they no longer have to fly coach. Um, so with that said, we would, uh, we're greatly encouraged knowing that NASA shares our industry's vision in low-cost boosters to enable even more exciting and less expensive uh, missions in exploration, science, and education. So NASA's vote of confidence in our team and our technology is a significant boost to our efforts and our goals at Firefly of making space for everyone. Thanks very much. George? Thank you, Maureen. And now to Peter Beck, the Chief Executive Officer of Rocket Lab USA. Peter? Thank you, George. So this is a very exciting time in space right now. In the last few years, what we've seen is small satellites decrease in mass and average by about 75%. So the missions that were typically done by a satellite the size of a car are now done by satellites the size of a refrigerator or, or even, even smaller. But of course, what's required to enable these missions is a small dedicated uh, launch vehicle. And what you see here is not one, but three commercial companies all striving to provide that service. And NASA in turn are enabling that service by uh, this venture class program. It's testament to, to NASA's vision for the future to invest in something this early. And it's, you know, it's, it's truly, truly fantastic. Now, Rocket Lab USA is, is pretty far along with our electron launch vehicle. Our first test flight is scheduled for early next year. Um, and we'll be flying our NASA mission on Flight uh, 5, which is late, two, late 2016, early 2017. Uh, Electron lifts uh, around about 150 kilograms to a 500 kilometer sun-synchronous circular orbit, or a few hundred kilograms to a low Earth elliptical uh, orbit. Now, cost is only half of the problem here. The other half, of course, is being able to fry, fly frequently and be able to fly on schedule. And Rocket Lab has gone to extreme efforts to ensure that, that that is a reality. In fact, you know, we've gone to other countries to build launch sites to, to enable that, and to enable our customers to choose from just about any inclination they, they need and to be able to, to meet the schedule they need and truly be able to fly weekly. Now, you've probably seen a lot of uh, hardware from Rocket Lab over the last couple of years, but um, we really thought it was, it was time that you saw some of the, the team behind Rocket Lab who make this happen. So if you can roll that video, that would be great, thanks. Throughout history, people have created a lot of things, but now and again, something is created that in itself is great, but what it enables is truly extraordinary. At Rocket Lab, for the last eight years, we've been known for the innovative technology that we create, but whichever piece of technology that you look at that was created here, there was always a Rocket Lab person behind it. We thought it was about time that you got to know the team who are dedicated to making it happen. The people who dream it, who design it, who build it, who test it, and who fly it. So this is us. And then there's you, using space to provide technologies to improve life on our planet and beyond. You've met the team here at Rocket Lab building Electron. Now it's your turn to use it to do something extraordinary. So what Rocket Lab is about is, is enabling small satellites to do really important things that affect us all. 
And uh, we're just so excited and, and honoured, really, to, to be able to fly these NASA missions and see what extraordinary things and science and, and innovations NASA is, is going, to, going to do with this launch vehicle. So, you know, we're, we're, we're just um, so excited to, to, be, to be able to give a first-class ride first. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And our next winner is Steve Isakowitz, the president of Virgin Galactic. Steve? Thank you, George, and uh, thank you, NASA. Um, my hat goes off to those people at NASA because I know any time to start a new program in Washington is a challenge these days and really appreciate the effort that's gone in for this new innovative program that's not only going to unleash the revolution that's going to be created by small sats, but also is going to change the way on how we conduct business and how we work with NASA. So thank you for that. Uh, at Virgin Galactic, our mission is, being, is driven by democratizing space. And in short, we're trying to open up the space frontier to all. So we've done it in two forms. One is our spaceship effort, where to date, 551 people have had the opportunity to, to go to space, many of them here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and at Virgin Galactic, we hope to exceed that number with the kind of people that want to also have the opportunity to experience space. Uh, NASA has also contributed to our efforts one of the things we try to achieve in the spaceship program is to provide experiments for people who used to fly in the space shuttle to have the opportunity to fly their experiments in a suborbital environment. And NASA created the Flight Opportunities Program to enable that. Now our second product is the Launcher One effort. And there again, NASA has come through with this venture class launch system, which is a great opportunity to facilitate what the private sector is investing its own money in. Uh, the revolution in small sats is extremely exciting. Uh, just last week, I had a chance to visit a university and meet with some of the undergrads that were having an opportunity to work on CubeSat-class satellites. Uh, what was particularly exciting is they were doing it not just as an academic exercise, they were doing it that with the thought that before they graduate, they'd have the opportunity to see it fly. Moreover, during the same visit, I had a chance to meet with some of the students that had recently graduated from, from that place, and they were starting up their own small sat companies with new technologies to change how these small satellites are built, as well as new applications on how they are used. Now in the private sector, we're now seeing that this is not just the playground of people who are interested in the technology, but this is real business. We find ourselves with private uh, institutional and venture class investors that are putting serious money to see that this happens. We are super thrilled that NASA has now joined this uh, our initial flights have already been booked as we signed a major contract just a couple months ago announced in the, to fly uh, com commercial communication satellites in the small set class that has provided us an important start on our efforts. Now NASA is joining our manifest. Uh, before I go to the video, I just want to highlight a few of the words that we're going to uh, put in our video that I don't want to make sure they don't go by you too fast. As you've heard today, dedicated is extremely important to enabling this class of payloads. Uh, we have gone too long with small payloads having to be secondary and having to wait for when they have the opportunity to fly or getting to the orbit they want to go to. So when and where is extremely important. Responsive. This is looking through the eyes of the customer and something we take very serious. What are the impediments that would enable this emerging field of small satellites? And it's the ability to go to the orbit that you want to go to from multiple locations. So this is where we, through our innovative air launch uh, design, have come up with an approach that gives you exactly the kind of flexibility that allows you to go anywhere where you want to go, when you want to go. We are fully funded, which means we have made the investment commitment to take us through our development program and into our test program so we can begin operations. Uh, with this, we've used it as an opportunity to really think through from the get-go what a good clean sheet design is to make sure you can build an affordable, fast, and flexible launch system. Second, we've made a major investment in our people. Uh, today, we have 150 people, and we are still growing, adding people to the ranks who bring a fantastic experience base. In fact, if you look at our current team, our team has worked on just about every US launch system that is flying today. Moreover, we have also hired people from outside the industry to bring new ideas on how we can do things better and faster. We've also made a major investment in our facilities. We just moved into a brand new facility a few months ago in Long Beach in Los Angeles, 150,000 square foot facility where we're starting to outfit it with state-of-the-art machining and tools to allow us to do some 3D and other advanced manufacturing. 
lastly, we are achieving some very impressive results. Uh, two numerous to go through here, but just last week we had the opportunity to fire our first stage engine for 90 seconds, and it provided just the results that we expected to see at this point in time, and kudos to the team to help bring that together. So with that, let's roll the video. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. And we're ready now to take questions. We'll begin first with news media here in the room. Then we'll go to the telephones for media off-site asking questions. And then we'll take social media questions, which you can participate in by going to hashtag AskNASA. So we'll start first uh, here, at the, uh, here at Kennedy Space Center. James? Uh, thanks, George. James Dane, Florida Today. Uh, so, of course, I'm interested in, in the potential for launches from here at KSC. Thank you, Maureen, for uh, uh, stepping up to start it off there. But um, could you clarify, is, is, uh, you mentioned an agreement with Space Florida. Does that mean would you be using 39C or a different site uh, for your launch? And, and does that, will that include your, your NASA launch? Is it just the, the suborbital test flights you, you mentioned that you're starting with? Well, for, for now, I can say that it will be our suborbital test flights, and we are aiming for 39C. And, and for the other guys, um, I understand you can do this from different places, but are you committing to, at all? Do you, do you expect to launch your vehicles from the Space Coast? Um, or, you know, Mark, I don't know if the, the, the missions will uh, necess necessitate different launch sites along the way, how that's going to work. Thanks. So the requirement we put out for them was that they could launch from anywhere. There was no specific bias where other. Um, but we're letting that be up to them. We gave them a, a range of inclinations they could launch from, which opens up Kennedy, it opens up other options. So I'll let them speak for themselves. So from a Rocket Lab perspective, we, you know, we have signed a NASA Space Launch Act, Launch Act Agreement and we are in discussions um, with the KPF for uh, the use of 39C. 39C just gives us that nice little um, sweet spot of incl inclination that we can't get out of some of the other sites that we have. So um, we, we're definitely pursuing it. Uh, for Virgin and Galactic, of course, we have flexibility given that we are air launched. Uh, our plans is to start the program for ourselves. We're going to be flying out of Mojave out in California, but we do have the ability to use the shuttle landing site for our own flights out of the Cape. All right, any other questions here in the room? You mentioned this is a competition. Daryl Nail, Fox 35 in Orlando. You mentioned this is a competition. Is there a second round to this, and does that come with a level of funding, and, and do you narrow down the field that we see here? So, so the way we set it up was to go out and buy a commercial launch service. So it was simply one round. 
We've got milestones in our contract that help us walk these providers through the design process, a test program, and then the final launch integration. So we don't have an option in there to go buy additional flights, but by allowing them to compete in this demonstration flight phase, it kind of opens the door for us to look at their maturity and then have them out there as an available option for the science community as they grow into potentially looking at using this class of launch services. And for the uh, Firefly, what kind of launch can we expect to see from uh, the Space Coast here? What will it look like? Uh, well, hopefully spectacular. Uh, <laughs> um, so it will be um, this, the test flights that we will launch from here will happen in 2017. And I guess, uh, what do you mean by what, does, what will it look in like? In terms of, uh, you know, a lot of launch watchers like to observe launches out here. There's different characteristics of the different vehicles. Yours mm -hmm. is smaller. So right. it, will there be the rumble, the boom, the there'll light? Be the, there'll be rumble, there'll be boom, and it'll definitely be uh, worth standing and uh, looking up to the sky and watching it go. It's going to be amazing, yes. Any other questions here in the room? All right, let's go to the phones. Uh, first, we have on the line Jeff Faust from Space News. Hi, um, thanks for uh, doing the press conference. I want to ask for the, the NASA representatives here, um, if you can uh, explain what uh, criteria you use to select these launch providers, given that nobody so far has, has actually done any launches. What were you looking at to choose these, and from how many uh, proposals did you select these three providers from? Hey, Jeff, this is Mark. Appreciate the question. So as our traditional acquisition process goes, we unfortunately can't give you how many bid on the contract and how many were there, but I'll, I'll definitely let you know there is a, there's a field out there that's trying to be the first to bring a product to market. So we're excited that we're able to award three. I mean, it's an outstanding opportunity for us to really get that first push for competition. From an evaluation standpoint, so we, we had a balance of, of cost and their capabilities. Um, from the capability side, we looked at the plans they have in place, we asked the providers all to give us a systems requirements review level package so we could understand how mature they were in their development. And, and then we kind of looked at that and balanced it with the cost to make sure we had the, the best viable solution going forward so we could see this as a successful venture. All right, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Hi, thanks, George. Uh, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, first, maybe for uh, for Mark uh, from the Launch Services Program perspective, um, uh, go going forward, are, are you involved in in you know your normal process, readiness reviews, technical reviews, going before going up to flight certification, or, or are you just along for the ride since these are uh, considered low uh, or uh, uh, high risk uh, type payloads? And also for Virgin Galactic, you recently announced uh, you're enlarging your your uh, Launcher One vehicle uh, to carry up more uh, payload to orbit. Um, have you selected a new carrier aircraft for that vehicle? Uh, and what is that? Thanks. So appreciate the question. Again, you got it right. We're definitely going after a, a high risk approach here. So the CubeSats represent that high risk tolerant payload, which are perfect for a demonstration of a first flight. So from the launch service program's perspective, again, we're along for the ride with our, our low risk tolerant, high value spacecraft. This time we're trying to step back a little bit and make sure the government gets out of the way, doesn't inhibit the, the commercial solutions these companies are trying to bring forward, but we're gonna definitely get insight so that when we do go forward and try to procure a launch service for a, a low risk tolerant spacecraft, we're one step ahead of the game with trying to certify them to, to make sure they can get a safe access to space. Steve? Thank you. Yeah, as to your question about increasing the size of our Launcher One, from the get-go we had a design philosophy that looked to have a launch vehicle that was evolvable. And as we continued to study the market, we knew we were ready to respond to what our customers needed. And it was pretty clear to us that our customers were looking at launch vehicles in the small set range that would be above some of the capability we were going to have in our, our original design. Fortunately, we had the kind of design through the engines that we were building that without actually making any changes to the engines themselves, but just by stretching the vehicle, we were able to get a vehicle that essentially could double its performance for about the same price point. And that's pretty exciting to our customers. Uh, as a result, we are gonna be flying it on a commercial aircraft, and we do expect in the coming short while here to announce exactly what aircraft we'll be flying on. Our next, our next uh, Steve, did you have a follow-up? Okay. Um, 
Randy Shostak from EOS. Randy? Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, yes, thanks very much for doing this. A um, couple of questions. First of all, can you clarify what will be the key milestones that you'll be tracking with these launch vehicles? So what we've set up in the contract is we will follow these providers through their preliminary design, critical design. We have a qualification test milestone where we can ask them to, to showcase their major technologies, and then we'll look at that data, review the qual test data, and then work through our typical launch campaign type milestones. To the company representatives, please. How do each of you view the other uh, selected companies? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll just say, you know, we're very excited. Uh, I'm a true believer in, in competition and the competition of new ideas. And I think that's what's so great about this segment of the market, whether it's the satellite companies that are building these new small sats and cube sats or the, the launch providers. Uh, you're seeing companies that are coming out to solve problems in very different ways. And I, I think that that's healthy. Um, personally, I actually applaud it every time I see uh, a launch with uh, these small sats being deployed. Sometimes I'm asked, do we view them as competition? And I actually just view that as great opportunities to see the market grow. Because I think as these satellites get demonstrated in orbit, I think the demand will grow for them. Yeah, and, and I, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, a bit of healthy competition is great, but there is also um, rocket karma. And you, you never put down any other rocket company because <laughs> it, is, it is a really hard thing to do. So, um, you know, competition's great, and, and we, we look forward to competing. And I would echo the same. Uh, I, I think the competition is fantastic. And with the growth that we're seeing in the market, I think you're going to see um, you know, a lot of different companies that are going to be competing for this space as well. And uh, the market will continue to grow, and we'll see more competition. Thank you. Our next questioner is Caleb Henry from Via Satellite Magazine. Caleb? Hi. Uh, my question is just, um, how many launches does NASA anticipate needing? I guess once this program is up and running, and then a quick follow-up would be, do you anticipate uh, certifying other launch providers in the future? So, so maybe I'll start. Again, we bought three demonstration flights. Once it gets up and running, again, looking towards their success and looking towards the future, it's the science community that drives that requirement. So I'll let Eric kind of maybe give his take from the Earth Science Division standpoint. Well, from an Earth Science standpoint, we look to, uh, we, we have a very regular um, cadence of competed missions that, that we put out there. Uh, we look for um, instruments and we look for complete missions. So our, um, our instrument uh, solicitations go out every 18 months. Our full missions go out every two years. Uh, so from that standpoint, we let the science drive what it is that we're looking for. So we're not necessarily looking to fly CubeSats per se, but we're looking to fly specific science. Now, when a CubeSat or a small sat can do that science, that's great. That's what we're looking for. So I think there's, there'll be plenty of opportunities within the Earth Science uh, Division alone uh, to uh, fly on this type of launch vehicle into the future. All right, we'll take some social media questions now from hashtag AskNASA. So could we have our first question? Right, this one's aimed at the whole panel, really, uh, commercial companies uh, specifically. Uh, can these small sets only be used for scientific research, or could they be used for commercial use such as TV, radio, and Internet? Well, I mean, um, I can speak from Rocket Lab's perspective. You know, our manifest is looking pretty full right through to mid-18, and the majority of those missions, in fact, the vast majority, are, are all commercial customers. So these are customers doing Earth observations and commu communications. So, uh, you know, most definitely the commercial um, small satellite guys are, are leading the way here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, you know, we see the demand coming in communications. Uh, you know, with our customer at OneWeb, they're putting up a large constellation of small satellites. We're seeing a lot in Earth observation. Uh, and we're looking at companies doing some, some pretty innovative things that are, are, are different outside the norm. So uh, we do see it at very much as an expanding market and some things we're not even thinking of. Some of the stuff I've seen that NASA is doing right now, like sending a couple of uh, CubeSats off to Mars, you know, who would have thought it just a short while back. Um, it's all been enabled by technology just in the last few years. It's made this all possible. 
And I would echo that as well. The majority of the customers that we are talking to, mostly commercial, uh, are wanting to do polar earth observation, but there's not a day that uh, doesn't go by when I don't get a phone call from a company that I'd not heard of before uh, looking to do something that absolutely um, boggles my mind. So there are um, really interesting developments happening every day. Another social media question? This one says, when will rocket ships and other spacecraft like these, uh, these are vehicles, be able to take public to space? Well, we're already doing it. So you can tell whoever asked the question that just signed up for a spaceship ride, and we're happy to take them on a wonderful opportunity to see space. And we have a fundamental policy at Rocket Lab not to fly meat, so we'll just leave that to version. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we've got, you know, just by flying these CubeSats, we're letting the public get into space. You know, I have a 11 year old home that's working on a science project and the thought that in only a couple years and there's some classrooms able to do it today where these kids are going to be able to do science experiments from a satellite in space versus messing up the kitchen at home. So I mean it's the opportunity is already there. Any other questions on the social media? Yes. We talk about the differences between capabilities and the new venture class systems um, uh, compared to rideshare as done before. You want to well, take that one? In the beginning, we do the rideshares, and it depends on how much excess capacity is left on a launch vehicle for us to go use. Uh, a lot of times, when a NASA mission is going to a particular orbit, they want to use as much performance of the vehicle they can to ensure they get the maximum amount of science out of it. Now, if there is an extra 50 kilograms on the vehicle, we put as many CubeSats as possible on there. Um, on a Delta II, right now we put three 3U three um, payloads, about 12 kilograms worth of uh, actual science payloads on those vehicles to go fly. Now when we're switching over to the Venture class, we have the opportunity to do at least a minimum of 60 like our requirement is, but even even more. So we're looking at, you know, instead of doing three 3Us, three we're looking at 15 to 33Us on a particular mission. All right, let's uh, do one more check here in the room. Any further questions? Uh, Daryl. NASA mentioned that uh, flight is expensive, $100 million for regular launch. Do any of the company representatives have any estimates on what it will cost, uh, being that this is now going to give access to everyone virtually? What will it cost to get into space? You mean for the entire vehicle? Okay, so for us, for an entire vehicle, it's $8 million. Rocket Lab, our, um, our beginning price is 4.9. And for Virgin Galactic, we have advertised it as being under 10 million. And follow up to NASA, with greater access and all these CubeSats flying into space, is there a saturation point? Do these things ever come down? Yeah, they do come down. We have guidance, uh, NASA policy, uh, orbital debris that we have to follow, and we follow through the strict point of the law. Uh, one of the things about these particular missions is that we're only going to like 425, 450, which allows the CubeSats to do about two years worth of science on orbit and then re-enter to the atmosphere and be out of the way of other, other spacecraft. So is there a saturation point? I don't think we're there yet. No. <laughs> Can there be one? Down well, the road, and it's something I think that you know everybody's looking at is obviously a sensitivity at times, but I don't think we're there yet. And with the orbital debris policies in place that the government is strictly following, I think we're, it's not something that we're all jumping around worried about. James. Thanks, uh, James Dean Flora today, and uh, maybe for, for Mark again, um, in terms of the competitive aspect here, you've selected these companies. Is there any further competition remaining about, you know, who flies first or who gets to fly which payloads or are they all interchangeable, you know, on each vehicle or um, is it, you know, already set who's flying what so and when? We haven't manifested certain payloads onto certain vehicles yet. Um, so there is competition inherent kind of in the process. Um, we don't want them all to rush. We gave them that requirement to launch by April 2018 and we want them to drive that schedule based on their own cadence. Um, I know Garrett's suite of payloads will, will be matched to the specific orbits that the vehicles will go to, but no specific follow-on that we have set in the schedule right as of now. For, for any of the, the company representatives, could you just touch any further on like how um, important, helpful, necessary this, this type of commitment from NASA is you're all referencing 
other flights that you have manifested. So, you know, if, it, if there is a growing market, you're already tapping it. Uh, did you need uh, NASA to step up to, to help you sort of make the, the business case for, for other flights? Or is it just a matter of, you know, trying to show NASA that, that you can carry, um, you know, perhaps more, more valuable payloads, you know, down the line? Or you know, just kind of what does this, this program mean to you? I can I jump in, and as I said in my comments earlier, I feel like this is a very vital step for us in growing this market in, in the larger realm. So we feel that, like the commercial com uh, customers, NASA is a very important customer to us, and knowing that they support the industry helps us greatly. So yes, it's very important to us. Yeah, and, and you know, like version for Rocket Lab, we're, we're fully funded as well, but um, you know, having that NASA stamp of approval and that 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 um, you know that science that can be done, I think, is is hugely important for for the you know for the government aspect to endorse um, these small launch vehicles. Yeah, and as for Virgin Galactic, I think it is important to see that the government is participating uh, and participating in a way that sort of reflects the class of payloads that are being flown. Um, sometimes you can turn an inexpensive launch vehicle into a very expensive one if you levy too many requirements on it. I think. NASA has taken about the right touch on this. I'm looking to get these payloads access to space while for the best price and for the best value uh, available. I'd also add that it's nice working with NASA. NASA brings a tremendous amount of technical expertise. The Launch Services Program has a fantastic record of success. So I think working with NASA will also help just improving the, the quality of the launches and the services that we provide. And we got a follow up on the uh, phone from Stephen Clark from spaceflightnow.com. Stephen? Thanks again, George. Uh, just uh, one clarification. Uh, uh, you know, ma matching the prices that recorded by the industry representatives and the contract values, uh, they're uh, not exactly the same. Uh, I wanted just to clarify uh, maybe the reason for that, and and is there a possibility that other payloads, uh, non-NASA payloads, could be manifested on these NASA demo flights, or these, or, or is this NASA? purchasing the entire launch in these three demo flight cases. Thanks. So I'll start. So this is this is NASA purchasing the entire launch. So we put out a requirement for 60 kilograms to low Earth orbit, but we do own the full capability of those rockets. So anything that we can squeeze out of their capability, we will. Um, and then I'll let them answer on the price, but from our perspective, again, you know, we are buying a demonstration mission. So we know we're one of the first flights of these companies. So obviously more risk on a first flight. So there's potentially a discount there, a chance for us to get in early as an early customer. But they ultimately will drive the price based on the commercial market that they're looking to serve. In the, in the case of uh, Virgin Galactic, you know, we, our price is relative to the level of risk the customer is willing to undertake. In the case of NASA, they wanted to fly on one of our early launches, which we plan to start off with our test flights. Uh, as to what prices will be for follow-on activities reflects what the customers want on specific launches. And from a Rocket Lab perspective, NASA will be flying on, uh, you know, quite late flights for us. We'll be, we'll be fully commercial by the time we, we fly the NASA payloads. And, um, you know, our, our price is a little bit higher, um, you know, based on the, the extra requirements are involved for the NASA mission over a standard basic commercial mission. And for Firefly, uh, NASA will be flying on some of our earlier missions, so there is some risk in there, and we did take that into consideration in the pricing. Let's do one more sweep of the room for any further questions for the media here. All right. Well, in that event, that uh, will conclude our briefing, and thank you very much.